there's so many points in this book where it does seem like you're right on the edge. Yes. I mean, it's this close to the whole thing just shutting down, and then, you know, by mercy, something happens yeah, that just buys you time. And I think you time. create that. I think some of it is the right place at the right time, but I think you create it, and I think it's the enthusiasm. I walked into that business, and if I had walked in, and I say to people on Dragon's Den, you probably heard me if you watched the show last night, I didn't put my house on the line. I never put my family. I was taught right from day one, you never put your family in jeopardy, no matter what. Now, I, I put them in jeopardy by moving them, but I never took their way that you could walk in and take their house away. I looked at business this way. The business had to pay for it, and the only guy who could make that work was me. And the only, the only thing I had to do was work hard and have to be there every day. When I say we were there every day for two and a half years, we never missed a day. Seven days a week we were open. The only day we closed was Christmas Day. So we knew what hard work was, and that's what the police force taught me. It taught me to work your butt right off. They're, they're, what do you mean? You didn't worry about your pay. We didn't have overtime in the RCMP at one time. One of the guys came back, we were doing a case one day, and he said to me, Jim, you know we're working about 17 cents an hour. I said, really? I'm enjoying the work. I never thought of the payday, you know. But that's because the passion was there. And I think when you got passion of anything you do, I collected garbage, I scrubbed floors, I've done as many things you do to, to make it work. When I left the police force before I got into Boston Pizza, I took five or six jobs. I sold appliances at Sears on a commission. And I never, I had friends of mine walk in who earned, when I earned that red uniform, and I walked out of that room, and they were saying, what the hell are you doing? You're driving a cab at night, and you're doing this? Are you, something gone wrong with you, or what? And it was the passion I wanted to do that business, because I could see when I went in that restaurant at night, how many people were lining up, and they were all young. And I thought, boy, if they're going to be like that across Canada, or in my little town, now we picked the worst town in the world, going to a retirement center. That was the worst <laughs> thing we did. But you make mistakes along the way, and you learn, but we, you know what? When we opened our store and where you talked about the nightclub business, mm -hmm. this is how goofy you get when you're like I was at that time. We walked in and there was a, we took over an S&S &S store. It was called uh, Shop and Safe. On the top floor was, was the 2,300, 2,500 square feet. And they had a basement for getting rid of uh, their bad lines. And it was a big stairway going downstairs. So I'm sitting in there and thinking, you know, we put tables and chairs and maybe we'll get some beer and wine. And, Next thing, I didn't know you had to have a license for all that stuff. <laughs> and yet I'd been a policeman, right? And so the guy, I phoned the liquor department, and he said, the liquor store said, yeah, the liquor inspector lives in Cologne. He'll drive down tomorrow and talk to you. So he said, you have to have this, 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 and this. I said, oh, boy, you have to have all that stuff. You just can't throw tables and chairs down. No. So you have to have a plan. So I went to Woodward's. Woodward's was a big department store in, in Vancouver in those days. And I walked in to see them, and they had a, an, a whole area where they, they did a plan for you. If you bought their stuff, it didn't cost you anything for the plan. So I went to them and I said, you know, we're talking about putting a sort of a, like a speakeasy type thing down below our pizza shop. And they said, oh, great, we'll do a plan up for you. As long as you buy, you know, it'll cost you $500 if you don't uh, you buy all our furniture. About 500 bucks, 10, 50,000 for the furniture. I, yeah, let's go with the plan. So we get the plan. I said, you know, you're expensive. You're too expensive. I'll pay you the 500 bucks. So I got the plan, walked back, went back to Penticton, went to the liquor board. Now, every church in Penticton, including my own, which was an Anglican church, all had petitions out about me opening a nightclub <laughs> five blocks away from the high school. It was the first nightclub ever in Penticton. And the reason I got the license is when I went to Victoria to see the guy that was the head of the liquor board, his name was Colonel McGugan, and he had pants that the braces came and the tops came to here. <laughs> and he sat there, and this lady got up, I'll never forget her. She had beautiful hair, she had big, big snow white hair, and a little husband standing beside her. And she was, a, a, honest to God, she was from the uh, Women's League of um, Against Alcoholism, whatever it was called at that time. Temperance Group. Temperance Group. And I thought, we're dead. That's it. The nightclub's built. We, we haven't paid for it yet, and this woman's going to shoot me down. And she stood up in the middle of this thing, and she preached for five minutes or ten minutes, and then 15, and then 20, we're sitting there. And I'm looking at the colonel who was at well beyond 70, with the pants up to here, sitting there looking at her, nodding like this. And he finally got to noon hour, and he said, we've got to stop now because it's lunchtime. 
So we walk out and I thought, you know, we're dead. I walk out to Dawn, I said, it's over. I said, you know, I can't figure it out. She, he, he never said a word. I thought McGugan would stop her. So he said, we reconvene at 2 o'clock. So I go over to the liquor inspector and I said, have you got any feeling? He said, Jim, I don't, but I, you know, wait till after lunch. I think there's going to be a change. What we didn't know is McGugan went down about four blocks down, or four doors down, and there was a restaurant he went to every day and had four scotches at lunch. <laughs> And I guess he had six that day because he, she was preaching about temperance and how anybody, any man that drinks is going to hell. That's what she told everybody. Well, he was going to hell. <laughs> so two, instead of two o'clock, we reconvened at 2.15. He walked in the door and he looked up like this and he said, lady, you've said enough. Sit down. You've got to listen. Right now, you're getting a liquor license so you people can leave. So they all left. The temperance group all got up and left. And they were muttering as they walked out the door. And he walked up, and he, I stood in front of him, and he said to me, do you know a drunk when you see one? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, how do you know a drunk when you see one? I said, I was stationed in Prince George three, three years in a row. We arrested about 100 a day. Yeah, you know drunks, he said. <laughs> don't you screw up. You get a license, and I don't want to ever see a drunk on your premises. And we didn't. And that's how we got the license. And we opened a place called Boston's Bottom. This it was below Boston Pizza. Is full of great anecdotes like that. I highly recommend it. But I do want to get people in the audience to shout out a question yeah. or two if you have them. So you're just a show of hands and the microphone here. I haven't read your book, but I've got it. But the question I've got is we were in Gravenhurst, we went to Boston Pizza. So we figure, okay, we're gonna get a pizza, we had we had a meal, and we wanted to get the Boston ale. We figured this is, how did you get the name Boston? It was it something you bought? And there's a Boston ale that you buy all over the states. You can't buy it. It's very difficult to buy here. Yeah. And I think you know the one I'm talking about. Yes, I do. Very well. Sam but they, that's right, but they don't have it. So I figured, why don't they have something like this in a Boston pizza of all places? That's my story. <laughs> so please, good good question, actually. Uh, the name Boston Pizza came from, it was a, in, in those days, there was no numbered companies. Everything had to be names. So when the Greeks put it together, uh, they went to the, their lawyer and they wanted to call it Parthenon Pizza to start with. <laughs> Thank God we'd never get that one. The second name was Santorini Pizzas, where they were from. And somebody t said to them, gosh, you have to have three names. Bell lived upstairs by the name of Bill Boston. And think about this, in, 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 in two more years, we're going to be 50 years old. 1964 is when they start September. There was a young kid from Ontario here that, by the name of Orr, went to the Boston Bruins. And that's one of the reasons that Gus used uh, this Boston came up. He called it, the Greeks don't pronounce it Boston pizza, they call it Boston pizza. If you talk to a Greek person in India, they're from the old country, they'll say Boston. So that's what it came and it was easy for them to spell. Now also Gus thought about the Boston Tea Party, he kept talking about that, but all those things, but the real reason was Bobby Orr lived up, or Bobby Orr, uh, Bill Boston lived up above his, his accountant, his name was Bill Boston. So that's the third choice and they didn't think they'd get that name. Thank God we did. <laughs> that's the story. Gentlemen at the microphone. Congratulations on the book, Jim. I look Thank forward you. to reading it. Thank you. Um, I actually remember uh, tasting Boston pizza in Alberta in the early 80s when I was a kid and liking yes. it there, so I'm glad you're here. Um, what, would you give, what advice would you give entrepreneurs about valuing their businesses properly? Good question. I, I think you hear this all the time, and I think the biggest thing is you can't evaluate what your time and your effort is. You've got to actually look at what your sales and what your, what your business is. When we did the valuation for me getting into the business, it caught, my first store cost $23,000, of which I had to get, uh, I, we actually got a loan to do it uh, from the Federal Development Bank, it was called the IDB at that time. And our valuation was based, and that was the first time I ever heard the word valuation, was based on what we thought as volume and what the other stores were doing. So we had the, um, we had some of the numbers from the other stores that, I, I was their first franchisee, but they had, I was the fourth store, the Briggs brothers had had three of them open by that time. So the valuation should be based on what the business is doing, not what you have put into it in time and effort. And we get a lot of people come on the show and, and anybody's going to a bank or everything, you can't go on what your time is worth. 
that, that's just a, a misnomer. You can't do that. You have to look at what the business is, project what you see based on what you've got. And that's why you hear, and what's changed in Dragon's Den across the country, and what's changed for entrepreneurs across the country is they see the show and they understand now when they come on, they do have their numbers. They've got to have some sales. It's hard for, for me to walk in. If I had walked into my partners to buy Boston Pizza and said, gee, I don't know what, you know, there's no sales, but we got a great idea, probably get shot down. I would have been still being a policeman somewhere but, or retired. But, uh, you know, that's, that's what you have to have. Make sure you have sales. You've got the passion to stay in it, and you've got your numbers. And, and when we say numbers, do a, do a projection. I never graduated from high school. That's, I'm not proud of that. I thought it was smarter, and, and I got away with it. You know, and I don't recommend, I, every one of my kids, including my grandchildren and my stepchildren, have gone to university, and I believe in that. You don't, you know, I, I don't, don't, don't do it my way. You know, I was fortunate. But what I'm saying is make sure that you, you learn it. And I said the kids coming up today, I took a long time to find that out because I didn't have the knowledge of a school or, or going on to school. And I had the ch chance to go. My parents were disappointed when I didn't. But I, I learned the hard way, and that, that sometimes is not the easy way. So do your valuation based on what the business is, not on what you put into it. Take the next question here. Hi. Um, my husband and I really enjoy the show Dragon's Den, and you're terrific on it. Thank you. It's always surprising to me to see how many crazy but creative uh, uh, new ideas are out there. My question is, what has been uh, your best investment in uh, what company on Dragon's Den has been the best thing that you've ever decided to invest in? I, I think there's a number of businesses I've invested in. Last year I invested in 43, of which if everyone had to come to fruition, it would have been about $6.3 million. Wow. Uh, the year before, I think I did 28 or something. But you remember that we do due do diligence after. So I have a team of people. I have an accountant, I have an MBA, and I got two other MBAs and, and uh, a lawyer and all that stuff that look after that stuff. I think the, the biggest ones for me have been, uh, the newest one from uh, this year you saw, in fact, we shot the show in, in April, May uh, this year, and it's called Steeped Tea. Yes. Uh, it was the first in the first show. That's been a very successful business. In fact, we're, we're meeting up with them tomorrow. Um, in Toronto here, and they're out of Hamilton. The other one was Frog Box. I don't know if you remember Frog Box. Uh, I was involved with Brett on that one. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of, they're not gonna make me big money, but it, what it does is it gives me a partnership with a lot of the people that I think are great people to work with. We've got small pieces of it. You know, I'm not there to have to, have to make the money to make another meal right now. But it's great to do business and show them what, we, what we've done. And they've taken it and run it. I mean, they just need an opportunity or, or a connection or something. Right. And, but there's a lot of them. And we, we're into them in small ways. There's been two or three. Uh, there's one I missed. And I often talk about, you know, you know, somebody asked me what one I missed was really a big one. And I don't, if you remember, it was the one with the, the uh, hockey girdle thing that helps uh, from having any... Um, uh, injuries to your, your groins, right? And it was a, and my son actually, who works for the, he's a uh, assistant general manager with the co uh, Coyotes, teams that are not playing. But um, he, he was the one that phoned me the, ne the night before and he said, Dad, you're getting one of the trainers that I used to know when I played for Vancouver. He said, uh, he's coming on with this girdle and I think it's a great thing. I didn't get in my mind that I, I thought, well, it's just gonna be for hockey. And I think as Canadians, we always think like that. <laughs> But there's a whole world that's used that, and that, that business today is worth about 10 million. Wow. So, wow. Steep Tea, watch for it, because it's another <laughs> one that's done really, and Frog Box was the other one that's done really well for me. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for the two more gentlemen lined up at the microphone. Thanks for taking questions. Um, going back to advice for entrepreneurs, if we can, uh, one of the themes that comes up, particularly on the show, uh, The Big Decision, which I'm yes. more of a fan of, is um, how entrepreneurs are spending, I guess, their time, particularly in the early days, kind of between spending time in the business versus kind of on the business, like spending time in the day-to-day -day operations versus, say, getting the next customer, that kind of stuff. Particular advice on how to, you know, how to spend your time, in, particularly in the early days. Well, like Diane said, there was, there's parts of the book where I... I probably was broken, didn't know it, and that was a good thing. Maybe if I had the education, I would have been broken, walked away from it. 
But I think at the time, and I look at entrepreneurs today, on that program that you saw uh, just last year, this is the second year of it, and you're, you're going to see another episode, I think, next Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. Um, it's, I looked at businesses at 500,000 up to as high as 15 million. And we looked at them on basis, and all, all the business I've looked in that business has all come down to one thing, their accounting side, their numbers side. They're not that they aren't hard workers. They've done be very, very successful. What they didn't take the time and effort, in which I did, which I was fortunate of, to have a guy that was doing my accounting for five years and then became my partner, was the fact that I went into and got professional help from a professional to look at my numbers and say where I was wrong. Because you're so focused on your business every day. I, was, I walked in, I didn't even know if there was a light bulb burnt out in the place. I was focused on working in the business and making sure that worked. What I wasn't looking at is my bottom line. And you remember when you get a statement, that's your report card. That's all it is, is a report card. And you better get one. And I've often said these business, the one interesting business I went into in New Brunswick was 13 million, I think they were as high as 13, 14 million a year, and they dropped down to 9 million. And they couldn't, it was still dropping. And I asked who the accountant was, and it was a cousin who had no training, formal training. Imagine a $13 million business and you don't have an accountant. Oh yeah, dad helped and did some on the weekends. Another business in Winnipeg I walked into, which was a steel company. Uh, big man, the people in there were great people. And I loved working with them, but they weren't people that run the business. They were people that should have been out on the floor because that's where all these people should have been, working out there and brought in professional help. When we bought Mr. Lube, the first thing we did was bring in and we had good, and they were great partners. It was a good business. But what is the first thing I sat down with the guys in the boardroom and said, and the partners? And we're not a public company. We're a private, little private company. It was a good friend of mine. I used to golf with him and my partner and I. And we bought that when he was dying. We, we bought the thing. He had prostate cancer and went out in 15 months. In the meantime, he wanted to, he said, Jim, my brothers and, and my family are not going to run this business. We need somebody to do it. And we thought, oh, my God, how do you take on something like this? So we did. And we've turned that company into a full franchise company because that's what we're good at and we know. But we brought in professional, what I call professional people. They're well-educated, being in business, and look at the numbers daily. And you have to have it. You've got to also have the, the entrepreneurship piece. But you have to, as much as you work hard in your business, you have to have the numbers as well. It's got to be equal. And where a lot of guys in the entrepreneurship, they work like crazy up here, but there's nothing going on down here. So make those equal. Thank you. Um, most inspirational. I, I thought you'd end up talking about business and, and just investing, but you've just been utterly inspiring. Um, my family has much of the background that, that you started with. I mean, of course, you've done so much more. But, you know, they came here nothing after the war from China, washed dishes, and uh, we became one of the largest restaurant accounts in North America, uh, wow. Chinese food. So we were in Edmonton, so that might have been our restaurant that you went to. <laughs> Probably ate at their restaurant. <laughs> yep, through the back door, exactly. Um, and then my father chased my mom out here, and they started their restaurant, and you know, wow. the rest is history. Yeah, um, it was a third Chinese restaurant in Toronto. But anyway, I, I give you that little background because uh, of this, and then my dad went on, and, and partly because of, of the things that my parents did and that we did, he got the Order of Canada. You know, so um, I, I put to you this: um, our I head of a management group, and, and our concern is that um, you know. Canadians are, are just as you said, you know, is about cash, hard work, and now we've reached the point where, um, you know, tainted, corrupt, indifferent, whatever, you know, politicians and, and people are are just destroying the goodness of generations. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I, I'd love your comment. I, and and you if know, so, what can we do? And I don't know if that's I too don't broad, think, but you know, what it's worth. I travel around the world. I've been fortunate to travel around the world. I've been to Russia. I've been to China. Uh, spent in China when you were probably about half your age now. I was back there opening, you know, opening in Taiwan when in 1977. Uh, went into mainland China, went into Shanghai when it was you, you hard time getting through the border. <coughs> went to Russia when it was falling down. We were going there one day, and I was at the Kremlin and just outside the Kremlin and, and Gorbachev, and I met Gorbachev. You'll see. I think there's there may be not in this, but I do have a picture of standing with Gorbachev and we're talking. And I've had a chance to meet Bill Clinton and Ger Gerald Ford at his house. So I've been fortunate, really, really fortunate, and, and, and because of business, we are living in the best country in the world. I don't I don't care what anybody tries to tell me or anybody has to say. It's not there's there's no corruption here compared to anything I see around the world. 
And the, we are, as Canadians, we're the most fortunate people in the world. And that's why we got people that two and three hundred thousand people want to come to this country every year. We have to limit it. It's not, it, you know, when you, if you were investing, if I give you a million dollars today, and said, here, go and invest it anywhere you want in the world, and I want it back in six months. Where would you go? Here or China? Here. Because China, you wouldn't get the same amount of dollars back. Trust me. You wouldn't. And I've been there. When, I, when, when, the, when the one was going up, as you know, they don't even want to, they don't want even, it's, it's useless outside the country. Is it a good country that's growing and, and going to be part of our deal? Yes, it is. But we are living in the best country in the world. And we I've lived in the United States for 12 years. Our banks are the strongest you've ever seen. Where does everybody want to look at banks today in the world? You know, we think about how, how tough they were when I was growing up and, and my dad saying the same thing. I, banks were tough to me. You had to have 30% down and 40%. Thank God now we all look back and say, wow, guess what's happening in the United States? That same thing is happening. I sat with Warren Buffett and I was telling the story about Warren Buffett and I was sitting one day and talking at, a, at, a, at an event. And he, he's the most amazing person to tell stories because he's 81 years old and, and still wants to be 91 when he's still doing deals. And his, his, his partner, Charlie Munger, is, is the same kind of a person. He's older. And, and Warren will always tell you that's the old guy over there. You know? <laughs> and he's 83 and one's 81. But you look at the two countries we've got. Where did anybody in the, in the world want to go to? What dollar do you deal with in China or Russia or anywhere in the world? It's the United States dollar. That's all you worry about. Is the U.S. coming back? Absolutely. But they're coming back the same way as we were taught and he was taught. He said, Jim, the rules don't have to be changed in the United States. They just have to be adhered to. People were flipping houses and doing all kinds of stuff. There's guys you just read. I don't know if you read the Wall Street Journal today. I did. And there was a guy that ran one of the biggest brokerage houses, went to jail for two years. It's a tough, it's a, these two countries are the two biggest things that we have in the, in the world that everybody looks to. And to me, this country here is the banking guru of the world. People are coming from China. They're coming from Japan. They're coming from uh, uh, Europe to look at what we did. And I think that that's why we're the strength that we will be. And we, recession, we, we, we don't have a recession compared to other countries. You've got to go when you're, can you imagine being in Greece today? Your valuation of your whole amount of money that you've saved all your life is worth less than 50%. I mean, come on, I, I, I'm not a rocket scientist here, but man, was I fortunate. The biggest thing that ever happened to me in my life, I was born in this country. And I w will always be a Canadian, always, 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 because I believe and I see and I understand. I look at countries around the world and I see guys like Italy and, and places and people in this room that came from those countries. Why? Why did my, why did my grandparents come from, from Ireland? Because there was a famine, there was nothing left. You came out here and you could, you could, as long as you could stake some land, you could live on it. We are living in the greatest country in the world and our kids are realizing this. And we're seeing this when I meet young kids. People come up to me and say, you know, you, you know you're, a, you're a fortunate, you did this and you did that. And you, I said, look at these kids coming today. They're smarter, quicker, faster. Oh, sure, we got some duds that are going to be out there. We have in every society. But our real kids, the kids that are, if you're teaching your kids at home the way I was taught, you won't have a problem. You bring your, you, 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 you're the parent. I don't, you know, nobody left it up to the teacher. You know what I was scared of when I was growing up at home? Coming home with a policeman brought me home. God help you if you walked in with him. I remember coming home one time and we got into a bit, and I, I was a bit wild. Brought me into the room one day and took me home and my mom and dad, my dad met me at the door. And it was, thanks constable for bringing him home. And I, the fear in my face was a hell of a lot more than what it was going with that policeman they ever gave me. And I'm telling you, that's what you have to do in, in, with our kids today. Understand them. I said to my kids and my grandchildren, I will send you anywhere in the world to get educated. I have now got a doctor that's 24 years old in my family, who is my granddaughter. She went to England. She did really well in Scotland, and then she's in Manchester. She's coming home. Where's she coming back? Not staying there. She's coming back here. But she was in the, one of the highly educated schools in the world. We live in the best part of the world. Everybody wants to come here. Thank God. But 
we, we don't have to worry about graft and what's going on. Yeah, sure, there, there's little bits of stuff you go around in every little city. I mean, it's, come on. This is not, you're not starving. We've got people in the street we should be going after. That's what our business is now. That's what I look at in my business. My time left on this earth is going to be making sure. You know, it, it's, I, I call it the monopoly game. I've been very fortunate to make all, all kinds of money. And I, I can't tell you how much I'm worth because I don't know. I don't ask. I work hard every day and I buy another business every other day. And I look at that stuff and I'm having fun with it. The day it isn't fun, I'm out of here. And when I look at it this way, I've got to start giving back. And the reason I have to give back is because you can't take it with you. When's the last time you've seen a hearse going down the street with a Brinks truck beef on? You haven't. So look at people that are less fortunate. I have a heck of a time, my wife will tell you, I have a heck of a time walking down the street and passing somebody sitting on the street because that could have been me. And that's why I think in this country we, we have to really, if we're going to give, give out and we have to give to people, look at the people around this, just around this city that are giving every day, every company. And to me, that's what it's all about. You're living in the best country in the world. That is the perfect point to end this on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. Great. Thank you.